everybody. It's going to be a pleasure uh, to, to be here. I am a neighbor. I live in Wayland. So uh, uh, I'm going to try to be a prophet in my own country. So uh, we'll, see, we'll see if that works. Uh, in order to raise healthy kids is in everyone's hands. Each one of us can be a developmental <laughs> asset for every young child in our community is a developmental asset. Well, what's an asset? An asset is something that is useful uh, to succeed. It could be a monetary asset. It could be a physical asset, like it's helpful if you're 6 foot 11 if you want to play basketball. A developmental asset <coughs> is something that will help young kids grow in healthy, positive ways. And they're all over. The key message that I will say, even though they're in our institutions and they're in our school buildings and they're in our parks and recreation areas, the key message is that the most important asset is the people in this room. With my colleagues at Tufts, I've discovered that despite Peter Benson talking about 40 assets, and those are great, the power to change kids' lives for the better is in each of our hands. And that's the key takeaway message for today. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> the theory and research and the application of that theory and research that comes out of the Institute for Applied Research and Youth Development. And uh, Joan Whitney, who's a very busy person, is also on our International Leadership Committee, basically our board of directors. So uh, I have to do well because she <laughs> She will come out in July and evaluate whether or not I'm doing well. So uh, uh, the Institute is a laboratory within the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Development at Tufts University. And as a laboratory, uh, we have a whole group of faculty and students who make this happen. I'm just one small uh, element in a huge group of uh, students and faculty who really put this work together. So this is really uh, a joint presentation from all these wonderful people. As I go around America and I speak to parent groups or even practitioner groups, and I say, how do you know if your kid is doing well? What they say to me is, well, my, my kid's not smoking, they're not drinking, they're not engaging in unsafe sex, they're not into crime and delinquency, they're not dropping out of school. In America, except for academic achievement, we tend to define positive behavior as the absence of bad. That's how we think my kid is not doing things and therefore they're good. As I'll explain in the next couple of minutes, this is a model that has been with us for well over 100 years. It's called the deficit model of young people. My goal, the goal of Peter Benson, the goal of other people in the applied youth development field is to provide not only a new vision for young people, but a new vocabulary, a new way to talk about young people. People. Imagine a young person who says, well, gee, I'm good because of what I'm not doing. Well, what are they doing that is indicative of thriving, of flourishing, of things that we value and care about and that are meaningful to us as citizens, as people, as parents? We're going to try to provide evidence in our lab, and I think we're succeeding, of a positive strength-based vision for young people. What we want to do is change the frame. For too long, because of all the problems that we think that we need to prevent in young people, we see young people as problems to be managed. We believe that every young person has strengths, and as a consequence of these strengths, they're not problems to be managed. Every young person is a resource to be developed. But this has to shift our thinking dramatically. Deficit models, especially in youth, started right here in Massachusetts. It started in Worcester. In 1904, a relatively new Harvard PhD by the name of Granville Stanley Hall went out and founded Clark University. He was a, a student of William James. You know, there's James, William James Hall at Harvard. So he became one of the key organizers of American psychology, and he published in 1904 the very first book in adolescence. And in it, he said the period is one of 
universal storm and stress of upheaval. Now, he was an evolutionary psychologist. He believed that adolescence was the period when we went from being beast-like to being civilized. And so that's why it was stormy and stressful. We have to overthrow the shackles of our uncivilized, beast-like past. So he wrote this book in 1904 and said adolescence is a period of storm and stress. While a lot of people didn't follow his specific notions, almost every person who came up with an idea about adolescence followed this notion of adolescence as a period of deficit. Anna Freud said adolescence is a universal developmental disturbance uh, initiated by the occurrence of a new sex drive. Eric Erickson, a name that you probably all know, said that adolescence is a period of identity crisis. And there's this nuclear struggle in adolescence between knowing who you are versus being lost and alienated. So all of these people who helped us frame our understanding of adolescence talked about them as having these problems that needed to be prevented. So the major approach to adolescence at first was, let's fix these broken young people. Or, if we wanted to be humane and not wait for them to actualize their problems, let's prevent them from having problems. Let's prevent them from becoming broken. But it would be inevitable, unless we intervened, unless we were careful, every young person would end up getting screwed up because of the unbridled sex drives and uh, the storm and stress of their lives. What a terrible, dispiriting, negative, discouraging, and patently false view of young people. Yet, in psychiatry, in psychology, and in our federal government, still today, that is the frame we use. Each year, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars in the United States to in, uh, support these silos, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse, and National Institute of Mental Health says there are these problems and we need to prevent them. And we spend hundreds of millions of dollars in preventing the bad and virtually nothing in promoting the positive. So that's what we're, you and I, are spending our money on. Of course, we're also spending it to bomb Iraq and prepare to bomb Iran, but we'll talk about that in the question and answer session. Uh, so with this approach, the young person, because of all these internal problems, is the locus of problems, and th to me, this is a blame the victim approach. We, 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 we see the young person's bad, we do nothing to promote their strengths, we don't even believe they have strengths, so we're blaming the victim. But is it possible to have uh, a strength model? Is it possible to promote healthy development, to promote well-being, which is good functioning at any one point in time, and thriving, which is the development of positive characteristics over time? So well-being, I define as simply how you're doing at any one point in time, I'm doing well. Thriving is I'm moving forward in a positive way. Can we promote a new vision, a new set of ideas about positive youth development? And you'll see in a couple of minutes that I think we can. Uh, the strength models that we're trying to develop are based on these four points. First, it's possible to define what we mean by positive youth development. It's possible to come up with terms of vocabulary that describes things that we want to instill in children, not just what we want to prevent. Second, there are resources, there are assets present from infancy all the way on through uh, the end of adolescence that can be aligned with young people to promote these positive ideas. They exist in families, they exist in schools, they in, exist in communities. We need to identify what they are and we need to figure out how to put kids and those resources together over time. If that's the case, if the clue, if the rationale to capitalizing on the potential for positive development is to align kid in context, not blame the victim, but say a kid has strength and that strength will be actualized if we can pair him or her up 
with the right resources in families, schools, and homes, then the individual context relation is what we should look at. We don't blame the victim. We don't blame the context. We have to put the right kid with the right setting together. That's the job of parents, teachers, and professionals to make that alignment. It's a very different task than just putting a kid in for therapy. And if we believe, and I, this is where my heart is, this last point, if we believe that every kid has strength, and it's our job to find and align, then we don't throw any kid away. We don't reject any kid. We don't say any kid because of their race, religion, ethnicity, sexual preference, or physical ability status is beyond enhancement. We invest in all kids, and I believe that's the fundamental facet of a social justice approach to young people. Every kid is a resource to be developed. Not every kid can reach the same level. There is going to be individual differences. I'll never be 6'11 and an NBA basketball player. And even if I were 6'11, I don't have the skills to do that, nor could I develop them. I've been practicing piano for 16 years. My son, uh, we, for Easter, uh, we have a, a, a mixed family. I'm Jewish, my wife is uh, Catholic, and so we celebrate the Jewish holidays and the the Christian holidays. So my son, who's a college freshman, came over and uh, I sat down and played the piano, which I've been practicing for 16 years. And I'm still doing uh, 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 Ode to Joy, you know, chopping. <laughs> yeah. Now, he sat down. He hasn't played the piano since he's six. He's 19. Opened up, you know what a fake book is? Opened up a, a book and just randomly turned to a page and played it perfectly. So, even with all the training in the world, I'll never reach his level. But I can improve. <laughs> I haven't found right, the right asset yet to get me to improve, but it's out there somewhere, I believe it. We all can enhance every kid to some degree. There's a key reason why we have to have this search for assets and alignment. And that's because the deficit approach that has dominated us for the last 102 years has absolutely failed the young people of America. It has absolutely failed. And it continues to fail even though you and I pay hundreds of millions of dollars each year to continue to invest in it. Let me illustrate the failure of the deficit approach, why we need critically to leave this room with a commitment to take a positive youth development, a PYD perspective. Let me just review for you the historically unprecedented challenges to the healthy development, not just of kids in the United States, but around the world. I think we all realize that there is a global crisis confronting kids. We may not realize the extent of it. Recently, I was asked, uh, a postdoc of, my, of mine and I were recently asked by the Rand Corporation and the State Department to go to Washington because the State Department in October, got the idea that, gee, maybe the approach we're taking to these young kids who are blowing themselves up in Iraq is not the best approach. Maybe there's another approach that we can divert these kids from blowing themselves up and put them on a more positive path. So my postdoc, Aida Balsano, who happens to be Muslim, and some of you may have heard her talk, uh, Aida and I went down to Rand in the State Department to try to give them a new view of what to do with Muslim young people. We'll see if it works. The, uh, the wheels are grinding slowly. So. But let me share with you some of the challenges facing not just America's kids, but the world's kids. Over the next decade, one billion, that's a thousand million new young people will be born on the face of the earth. That is a hundred million a year. Most of these newborns will be children of color. Most of them will be born in developing nations. No one in this room, in this state, in this country, on this planet knows how we're going to feed these kids. We won't have enough food for them. There'll be huge pockets of starvation. 
We don't know how we're going to handle the waste products they create. We don't know how we're going to create the energy needed to fuel their lives. We don't know how we're going to create the energy to fill up our gas tanks with oil over $70 a barrel now and likely to go higher. And we don't know how we're going to create jobs for these youth, especially productive, fulfilling jobs. How many of you have cell phones? Okay. Uh, you know those little uh, SE, what do they call those little chips you have that activate the cell phones? SIM cards? So they're made with particular minerals. Don't ask me the mineral. But you know where those minerals come from? They come from a certain uh, uh, mud that exists in Africa. And they have to, uh, to get one SIM card, to get enough minerals for one SIM card, you have to uh, uh, sift through about 100 pounds of mud. Who does that work? Eight-year-old African kids working for about three cents an hour. Those are the jobs these kids have. Think about that next time you get a cell phone call. Think about that if you are committed to social justice. So we need real jobs. The fact of the matter is, the best estimates are that for these one billion kids, these are the rosiest economic estimates, 55 million jobs will be created for the one billion kids. That means 945 million kids won't have the option of even having a job in the Mideast, Yemen, uh, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, uh, the United Arab Emirates. There'll be 55 million new kids born of this uh, 1 billion, 55 million, and the new jobs created there will be 5 million. Again, the most rosy, econ so economic estimate. Five, 50 million jobs short. What will these kids do? If life on Earth has no hope for them, if they don't have any chance of a hopeful future, well, maybe they'll continue jihad, and maybe they'll think it's worthwhile to fly planes into buildings. This is some of the points I try to raise at the State Department. What's going on in Africa affects us here, affects the likelihood that this young lady, that young girl, that, that young lady will have a chance to grow up in a healthy world. It's even worse. No one today knows how we're going to address the social justice issues between the rich and the poor, the North and the South. No one knows how in Africa we're going to treat the tens of millions of youth who will live their lives as AIDS orphans. Tony Earls, my colleague uh, from uh, psychiatry and public health at Harvard, he and his wife spend six months every year in Tanzania. Why? Because he's trying to deal with the fact that within the next decade, there will be no adults left in Tanzania. They'll all be dead. And so the nation will be comprised just of young people with no adults. Hit have we ever faced that in the history of the world? When was the last time Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice made an impassioned speech about that? And how are we going to diminish the marginalization, alienation, and demonization of youth? I've tra traveled around the world at the behest of the Kellogg Foundation uh, when they were uh, helping set up the International Youth Foundation. And I've been in every part of the world uh, looking at the youth, community-based youth programs. And what I've seen in South America, in Asia, even in Europe, is street children rounded up and disappeared. If you know the, 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 the uh, Catch-22, how, or disappeared. They disappeared, kids. Kids are being rounded up and slaughtered as if they were wild dogs.
I've seen it with my own eyes. How are we going to stop this? Lest you think, and I know you don't, that this is just their problem, let me turn to what's happening right here in the United States. Right now, we have about 40 million kids between the ages of 10 and 19 years. That's just the uh, arbitrary a decade that we define in the literature as adolescence. You, know, you have to define, there's a million ways of defining adolescence. We arbitrarily say the second decade of life is adolescence. We can argue that that may not be the right, but let me stipulate that for a moment. 40 million kids in that decade. Here are the major categories of risk behaviors that afflict our young people. One category, unsafe sex, teen pregnancy, teen parenting. Another, school failure, underachievement, and dropout. Delinquency, crime and violence, drug and alcohol use and abuse. Any one of these problems will decrease a child's life chances. In fact, some of these problems will decrease their chances of having a life. Of these 40 million American kids to whom we need to turn within a decade, they're kids now, but they'll be adults voting, hopefully contributing to the economy, hopefully contributing to family life, hopefully contributing to the moral character of America. Of these 40 million kids, 50% engage in two or more categories of those behaviors. And 10%, 4 million kids, do all four. Go to uh, Emerson Hospital on a Saturday night and see how many kids are brought in because of one of those behaviors, drinking and driving or drug use. I don't need to go into details. You all know good kids who nevertheless engage in these behaviors. Complicating all of this, perhaps not in Concord, perhaps not in the western suburbs, but complicating all of this in America is poverty. This is the continuing structural problem with our own nation. Beginning in the 1980s and continuing through this morning, about 20% of all children and adolescents are poor. They live in families below the poverty line, actually below 150% of the poverty line as well. So. The situation is, is very bad. Poverty exists in all areas of the country. It is not just an urban problem. It's not just a problem of the Northeast. It, it exists everywhere. Poverty rates among single-parent female head of household families 700% to 800% higher than in two-parent intact families. 25% of America's families are single parent female head of household families. This last bullet is really sad. I'm looking around this room. We're not a particularly racially diverse group in this room. So let me remind you what this bullet means. An American baby born this morning who is European American, however you want to define that, has an 11% chance of living his or her whole, whole, whole childhood in poverty. A Latino baby. 38% chance, and a black baby, a 44% chance. Now, make no mistake about it, an 11% chance to live your childhood and adolescence in poverty is a rate way too high when we can give a, what, a $400 million golden parachute to the recently retired head of a gas company. But does anyone in this room, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, liberal, conservative, does anyone think that any semblance of the idea and values of America is being confirmed when there's a 400% difference in the chances of being poor just on the basis of your race? Is that social justice? Is that America? Is that what we want to live with? Is that what we want to tell our children? we do to young people, 400% different probability of being poor just because of the race or ethnicity you're dealt with?
These problems persist because we continue to look at kids as problems. Sure, there are issues that we need to prevent. Issues of schizophrenia have nothing really to do with uh, uh, race or ethnicity. Kids do have uh, emotional mental problems that, that need to be ameliorated and prevented. But most of these problems that I've talked of, these externalizing behaviors like school dropout, sex and uh, drugs, crime and violence, we continue to invest in these silos of deficit and we continue to have the problems. Yeah, we see a drop in marijuana use, but sniffing glue goes up. Yeah, we see some drop in teen pregnancy, that's great, but the fact of the matter is, there's still 40,000 girls a year, 14, year uh, 14 years of age or younger, who give birth every year in this country. And I don't know if you saw Time Magazine last week, dropout rates are horrendous in this country. And in some pockets of the nation, in Detroit, the dropout rate among African-American males is over 60%. It's more likely that an African-American kid in Southeast Michigan, Flint, Detroit, will either be dead or in jail by age 18 than will he graduate from high school. Talk about not having hope for a future. We need to try something new. We need to give this strength-based model a chance. So what is it? What is this PYD perspective? There are four pillars. First, the belief is that all youth have the potential to change. Human behavior is nothing if it's not plastic. We're always changing. We've just looked at that as something that's there. Let's capitalize on the great ability of people to change, especially young people, to see that as a strength. You know, people say, well, there's too many limits to change. There's a wonderful study going on in Germany, the Berlin Study of Aging, which shows that people in the ninth, 10th, and even the 11th decade of life can still learn new cognitive tasks. Our brain continues to develop into the, at least the seventh and eighth decade of life. So I don't know, I don't want to get too technical, but you know, each uh, uh, nerve cell has a long part called an axon, and that it's covered with a little sheath called myelin. And depending on the integrity of that sheath, the electrical conductivity of the brain is modulated. Well, that sheath continues to grow into the seventh and eighth decade of life. Moreover, in adolescence, contrary to what my mother told me, my mother told me, you know, if you hit your head and you lose a brain cell, you'll never get it back. There's new neural growth in adolescence. It corresponds, interestingly, to the time in life when young kids are developing what Piaget called formal operations, the ability to think abstractly and hypothetically, scientifically. So new neuron cells are growing in adolescence. Let's see this growth, this potential for change as a strength and say every kid goes through it, every kid has a strength. All contexts have resources and we term them developmental assets. And that's what we need to identify. They're found in family schools, faith institutions, youth serving organizations, the community more generally, and I'll help you identify them in a little bit. And finally, the key hypothesis here is that if the strengths of young people are combined with these assets, then you can promote PYD in all youth. Well, what is PYD? It's a long story how we got these C's. People kept on, since about 1990, kept on inventing terms that we could use to characterize positive development. What the field, and the field is both researchers and practitioners have hit upon, is five C's that capture all the different things that we can talk about. So it's just a, uh, uh, a heuristic device to, and it's good because you have five fingers, so, you can, so it, it works well. First is competence. And we all know about academic competence, but there are other ways to be competent. There's being competent socially, there's being competent vocationally, there's being competent as a person, person in your faith tradition, 
So there's all these ways of being competent. Confidence. This is a young person's sense of self that I am an efficacious person, that I have the abilities to act, that I can make a difference if I act. That is probably the key component of self-concept or identity, that I matter, I can make a difference. Feeling that you matter, that you can make a difference, is the essential ingredient for a young person to have hope in themselves, that there can be some positive outcome in the future. Connection. This is the knowledge that I can't do it myself, I need other people, and by gosh, I have good relations with my parents, with my peers, with coaches, mentors, people in my community. Character, a moral compass, integrity, a, a sense of knowing what is right and feeling that it's important for me to do what is right. And related critically to that is caring or compassion. This is a sense of social justice. Part of doing right is saying, just because I have mine doesn't mean I shouldn't be worried that you have yours. This is a sense of trying to level the playing field, not being satisfied that you live in Concord or Acton, Wayland, Weston, and saying, well, I lucked out, that's all I need to worry about. But recognizing that what happens with those African kids digging mud for three cents an hour is not only important, but even for just enlightened self-interest will affect the world I live in. The idea has been that when a young person is competent, is confident that they can make a difference, is well connected to others, has character and cares, that this will be a young person who develops a sixth C, a moral social commitment to contribute. To contribute in four ways, to yourself, by keeping yourself healthy and fit, so that you're not a drag on other people, contributing to your family, contributing to your community, and ultimately, although this is a very Western idea, I admit, contributing to civil society, contributing to keeping the institutions that allow us to be a democracy viable and prospering. I admit that that last thing is currently being challenged now. Listen to Lou Dobbs if you think I'm wrong. Uh, okay. Well, how can we promote positive youth development? What community actions serve as developmental assets for PYD? That's, I guess, why you came here this morning to hear that. People have done surveys for 20 years. And some people have lists of 15 things you can do. Other people have lists of 10. I've boiled it down to three. I've done it with the help of Bob Blum, who is uh, a professor at Johns Hopkins University Medical School, Jeannie Brooks-Gunn, who's a professor at uh, 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 Teachers College at Columbia. Basically, if you put three things together simultaneously and integratively in everything you do, in your homes, in your schools, in your community, you're going to help be an asset builder. What are the three things? Positive, caring, adult youth relations that are sustainable. Our colleague, uh, uh, Gene Rhodes from uh, UMass Boston, has done wonderful studies of mentoring, looking at uh, big brothers, big sisters, and what she's found is that if mentoring relationships, these are uh, uh, programmatic mentoring relationships, obviously, in big brothers, big sisters, if they break down before a year, it actually hurts the kid. So we have to keep these relationships sustained for at least about a year if they're going to have any positive effect. So promoting caring adult youth relationships. What, what do you do in those relationships? You build skills in the kid. You don't say to the kid, just say no. You say, here's what you not only should say, but here's what you, do, you need to do, and here's how you do it. And then this is the big one. This is the hardest part for adults to do. Even though you're with the kid, you're, you're part of this supporting network, you let the kid participate, in fact, lead every program. This is one of the great things that I've seen in Concord, is that young kids are now infused in every aspect of the community. They're deciding 
how the community moves forward on behalf of kids. And uh, I was chatting with uh, one of the folks, I don't know if she wants me to identify her, uh, before, be, uh, before the meeting started, and I work in Cambridge as well. And that is not happening in Cambridge. Cambridge is a resistance to letting kids serve on the Cambridge Kids Council. <laughs> there are no kids allowed on the Cambridge Kids Council. <laughs> uh, so we need to promote this. We need to put these big three together. So what, what do effective youth programs do? They align the internal strengths of young people with the community resources requisite for positive development. And these are, when you do this alignment, these are the developmental assets for PYD. Let me give you a, an example of this in the after-school programs that exist in your communities and communities around the country. Because obviously, what, what is a program? It's a sustained, planned set of actions that are taken to provide some service. It could be for small businesses, it could be for families, it could be for kids. After-school programs are almost a ubiquitous part of the lives of young people. And if I'm right, they should be important assets. And, they, and you'll see they are. So we've been doing this uh, 4-H study of positive youth development to look at 4-H, which is still America's largest youth-serving program. Anybody here ever in 4-H? One or two. 4-H uh, serves 7 million kids a year. It used to be thought of as a completely rural program, but now only 2% of America's kids are rural kids, and only about 5% you know, of 4-H's kids are rural kids, most of them are suburban kids. About 40% are urban kids, and about the same percentage are kids of color. So 4-H, 7 million kids a year, it's larger than Boys and Girls Clubs, larger than the Ys, larger than the Scouts. It's, it's huge. Uh, so 4-H asks us to say, what's the effect of after-school programs on PYD? But not just 4-H programs. They want to know, they're very enlightened. We're part of a group. How do we work together? Here's the vision of 4-H, a world in which youth and adults learn, grow, and work together as catalysts for positive change. Sounds very similar to the big three. And in fact, if you go to the web page, you see that their, their model for positive youth development is, in fact, the big three. They were very happy to learn that those big three came out to be the big three, because that's what they've been saying for about 100 years. So we've started this study at, uh, at Tufts called the 4-H Study of Positive Youth Development to look at the role of developmental assets in families, schools, and uh, communities, but in particular to look at after-school programs. Here is our model. It's one that you already know. It looks, this is the way a, a researcher puts it up, but it's one that I've given you verbally. When you align the strengths of kids with contextual assets, you'll get PYD, defined by these five things, and two things will happen when a kid develops positively. They'll contribute, and you'll see reduced risk behaviors. See, that, you've just taken your first course in what's called structural equation modeling. <laughs> That's, then you attach numbers to all of this, and you have a statistical model. Okay. So the 4-H study, I'll do this very quickly. We're studying about, we started uh, with about 2,000 kids. The study actually gets uh, bigger as we go along, because we keep on picking up new kids. Uh, we have kids from all over the country. I think we're now in 25 states. Uh, we're not in Hawaii. I'm trying to get into Hawaii because I volunteered to do all the personal testing <laughs> there, although I've gotten the opportunity to go to Nebraska in January, to, <laughs> but I'm looking for Hawaii. But, uh, uh, so we're now in, uh, I think, 25 states. Uh, so what have we discovered? you can reliably and, val and validly measure the C's. So now we have a tool that we can give to communities to measure those C's. And we can also uh, measure contribution. The C's cluster together. So you can now speak not only of each C, but you can speak overall of positive youth development. As we would hope, as PYD goes up, delinquency, depression, other risk behaviors go down, drug use, smoking. Uh, interestingly, Girls score higher on PYD and lower on delinquency. In fact, girls do better on everything. 
through the seventh grade. It, it looks like it may be changing in the eighth grade. We actually uh, expect that, and we could talk about that, why uh, girls have what's called cumulative risk. They're making school changes and going through uh, pubertal changes faster and earlier than boys, so there tends to be more of a risk for girls during that uh, time of life, but it, they bounce back, say, says the other studies. But right now, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, girls are doing better in everything. Uh, all the kids are doing well across the country, but European American, uh, that should be a dash, not a comma, I'm sorry, European American and Latinos are scoring higher. No difference between European American and Latino, interestingly, but uh, they're scoring higher. And perhaps, uh, not surprisingly, and I was a little bit disappointed in this given my social justice orientation, money matters. I know that's shocking. But, uh, <laughs> If it didn't, I'd probably worry about the quality of the data set, if it didn't matter. But it's still, given my politics, it's, it's somewhat disappointing. So what about after school activities? Fifth and sixth graders participate, participate in structured after school activities at a high level. Fewer than 12% of kids in our sample, which is a pretty good cross-section of kids in the United States, don't do anything structured. Now, when you're not doing anything structured, doesn't mean you're out robbing banks. You could be home doing your homework, or you could be working, right, or just hanging out. But most kids do something structured. Uh, however, and this was a shock to all the people who think you're either in 4-H or nothing, or boys and girls clubs or nothing, most kids participate in about four different activities a year. For those of you who have kids of this age and know how much you drive them around to go to these, that's probably not a surprise to you. It was a surprise, though, to the leaders of 4-H and Boys and Girls Club that, my gosh, we're dealing with the same kids. Uh, however, not only is there a cacophony of messages, the message you get from a 4-H club or a Boys and Girls Club is not necessarily the same message you get from uh, uh, a football coach win at any cost versus cooperation is great. Those are two different messages. So there could be a cacophony of messages that kids get. But complicating that is what kids do each year changes dramatically. The particular profile of four and a half at, on average activities changes from one year to the next. Activity participation, however, is good for kids. More is better. That's one of the uh, uh, messages of Peter Benson, the more assets you have, the better. That seems to hold out. Activities, structured activities should be assets, and in fact, uh, they predict both PYD and contribution. This is uh, an example of uh, the cacophony of activities taken by our kids in the fifth grade. 19% uh, of the kids uh, do uh, only one program, and we divided programs into youth development programs, uh, which are 4-H, Boys and Girls Clubs, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Scouting, YMCA, sports only, soccer, baseball, basketball, arts, which could be uh, painting or dancing, clubs, which could be a religious club, it could be a stamp collecting club, a, uh, a debate club, what? Bird -watching. A bird watching club. Uh, so 20% do one, about 12%, as I said, do not. This is fifth grade, 10-year-olds. Two types, a quarter of the kids. Another quarter do three types and uh, four types, about 13%. And this is only dichotomous. Do they do it or not? We also have data on how much do they do it. That gets even more complicated. Uh, in sixth grade, you can see, uh, the percentage of doing nothing drops, kids start doing more, and you can see uh, the uh, amount of uh, two, three, four programs is also pretty high. But look at this. Here we said, what's the likelihood, if you're in one profile of activities in grade five, that you'll change in grade six? So if you were only in a YD program in five, 93.3% of the time you changed out of it. That wasn't what you were doing. So if you look to see, my God, kids are moving all over the, the place. They're, they're moving targets. Which means if we want sustained positive relations, 
If that's one of the big three, we have a problem here. And if we want skill building in those relationships, they may not be learning the same skill sets. They're moving around and we have a challenge to maintain those positive relationships. This is why I wanted to present these data to you. Now, are youth development programs the only place you can find assets? No, I've emphasized the home and the school. Obviously, you know, why did Willie Sutton uh, rob banks? Remember he was asked that? He said, well, that's where the money is. Why do we study school? Why do we study schools and families and after school programs? Because that's where the kids are. So let's see how they contribute. And I have to here give a little uh, uh, sidebar to, to this. All of you have heard about Peter Benson's 40 assets. Peter Benson, as some of you know, was one of my dear friends. In fact, I was on the search committee that hired Peter for his first job after he received his doctorate. We've been friends for 35 years. Uh, we publish together. I'm a consultant to Search Institute. He's a consultant to uh, my institute. So this is by no way a criticism. Peter, faced with the challenges that he was faced with in trying to take Sur make Search Institute a viable contributor to doing something positive for kids, given all the, the, the doom and gloom I talked about, he made up 40 assets. He sat down at his desk and said, here are 40 things. When we actually study empirically through measurement whether those 40 assets exist as 40 separate things, we find they don't. In fact, what we find is you can reduce all of those assets to four assets. Doesn't it, it's easy to remember four. You don't even need that fifth finger. You could do something else with it. Four assets in each of the three key places you find kids, family, schools, and home. So it's a much simpler way of thinking about things. It's not that those 40 things you look at in Peter's are not important. They are, but there's a lot of redundancy in them, a lot of overlap. So we've found through the, the work of one of my former doctoral students, a brilliant uh, uh, researcher and theoretician and practitioner, Christina Theokis, who is now working at Child Trends. I don't know if you know Child Trends, but uh, they're uh, a major research organization in Washington that looks at indicators of positive development. You go to their website, they do great work. We find that there are four types of assets. Human resources. The skills, strengths, talents of individuals. Education employment level of adults in the setting, for example is one indication of, of these assets. So you as people are important assets. Then there is physical institutional resources, opportunities for learning, recreation, engagement with others. So after school programs is a key asset. Uh, youth facilities, fields, playgrounds, libraries. Those are all institutional resources that are important. You know, uh, I do a lot of work in Detroit and that's why I keep on uh, Another study I have, we're, we're doing a longitudinal study of gang youth in Detroit, and we've been studying them for uh, over five years now. Uh, anybody know Detroit at all? Well, the Champs-Élysées, I don't know if I pronounced that right, the Champs-Élysées of Detroit used to be Woodward Avenue. Uh, all the great uh, 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 rock and roll theaters that they had before were all along Woodward Avenue. Woodward Avenue is now a wasteland. The only thing you see on Woodward Avenue are liquor stores, pawn shops, and gun shops. Those are the only institutional resources you see. And you see burned out houses. You don't see that in Concord and Wayland. You don't see many burned out houses or gun shops uh, or liquor. Well, you do see some liquor stores. Uh, but, uh, or pawn shops. You don't see a lot of pawn shops. In in Lincoln or Concord, I don't think, do you? No, okay. But you do see after school programs, youth facilities, fields, playgrounds, libraries. So those, that's the second type of asset. 
Collective activity, this is important. There's a, another construct that you may have heard of called collective efficacy. That's sort of like a perceived variable. But what we went wanted to measure is what are the opportunities for kids in a community to get those sustained positive adult relations. In Cambridge, it's tough because there are no kids on the Cambridge Kids Council. In Concord, it's easier. So what are the opportunities that exist for adults and youth to come together to collaborate? What hap what's the access that uh, teachers and kids have? If you're in a class with 20 students and you're a, a skilled, committed teacher, you have, a kid has a much greater opportunity to work with you than if you're that same teacher with 38 kids in a class. It's just a matter of dividing by eight hours and you see that, that collective efficacy, collective activity score goes down. This is critical. And it's as critical in Concord as it is in Detroit. Accessibility. There are great sports after school programs in Detroit. Sometimes they're four blocks away from where a kid is living. They don't have access. Why? Because you have to walk across Woodward Avenue, where in addition to those institutions I talked about, there's gangs and hookers and shooting. And a responsible parent says, I'm not going to let you do that walk. And I'm not brave enough to do it myself. In Nebraska, where there's less of those gang shootings, a 13-year-old kid can live five miles away from the after-school program, and they don't have money in the school district to provide buses. So the kid can't get to the program. In Concord, how do kids who live out by where you guys live get to downtown? They have to. And what happens if you're working? Somebody else does. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. But it, it's, it's a challenge. And so you carpool. But, but you guys have cars. How does a person in Flint, Michigan who doesn't have a car do that? So accessibility is important. The four assets. People, institution, collective activity, accessibility. And you can look at this in the home in the school, and of course, in the community. So what did we find? Here is some very good news. If you look across the three domains that we're talking about, community, school, and home, it is always the case that family assets are most important for positive youth development. Thank goodness. It would be pretty sad if the family, which is the key institution of our society, did not come out that way. And I want to tell you that every time I present this finding to youth practitioners, 4-H, Boys and Girls Club, they breathe a sigh of relief, relief also. The problem is that with 25% of kids having single parent families, with you guys all stressed out because of dual career families and working around the clock, you may not be able to be the asset that you could be were you available. So family assets are the most important. We need to find out ways to increase the probability that kids will have families. Why? Because collective activity in the family turns out to be the most important asset of all family assets. In fact, collective activity in the family, for example, eating dinner together, is the, most, the strongest asset of all the assets we measured. For those of you who have had uh, adolescents, you know how difficult it is to eat dinner together. Their schedules, your schedules, the fact that they eat everything in five minutes and that's their first dinner. My, my youngest son, who's now 19 and a freshman at Tufts, he ate two dinners, five minutes with my wife and myself, and then somewhere between 10 and 11, he came down for a second dinner. And that was his lifestyle. So collective activity in the family is the most important. It's hard to achieve, not because we don't care, but because of our lifestyles. Uh, so within the family, school, and the community, I want you to look at the, what were the most important assets. The one thing you find is that in every setting, People are the most important asset.
And again, that was the take home message I began with. In every setting, people are the ones that matter most. This is a great leveler because this goes beyond socioeconomic status. It's not that Concord is able to build skateboard parks. That's great. Compassion and caring and engagement with young people. In every case, we can enhance the lives of young people by just seeing ourselves, recognizing that we're asset builders. People can do it. So what's the projected impact of the study and of the work I'm trying to do? Well, clearly we're affecting research. We're, we're getting people involved now and not looking at just the kid or not looking at the context, but we're saying you have to look at that relation. And that's a new wave of research, especially because it's framed in this positive approach. So I hope you'll agree. I know most of you are, are not invested in research, but I hope you'll agree that we need a different lens for research. We can't keep on just doing research about a deficit model. I think there are implications of this work for practice. First, it says that if you're in a practitioner role with kids, you better collaborate because you're not the only one that's looking at that kid. Whether you're running an after school program, a social service agency, whether you're an educator, that kid has a whole array of experiences and they're likely to change. And so the second implication is not only collaborate, but try to figure out a way that across the community, that kid will be assured of the big three. That they will continue to have positive adult youth relations, that they'll continue to have skill building activities, and that they'll continue to matter. That you will say, show you matter, because I'm making you not only a participant, but a leader. And I think this study and the work we're doing has implications for advocacy. We should all be empowered by the fact that not only is it possible and appropriate to take a positive development view of every young kid, but that we have solutions to these myriad problems besetting them. That we can, by building assets, not only prevent those problems, but promote things that kids will value, those seas of positive development. We should begin advocating that we need not only to have pillars of deficit reduction, but across all these funding agencies, we should begin to find ways to give communities resources to promote the positive, not only to prevent the bad. So I think working together with communities, this is my last overhead, we can answer the really big uh, question. Now here's the way I might phrase it as a researcher. What actions, predicate on the big three, of what duration, remember that kids are moving, with what youth, kids are different uh, from different socioeconomic status, race, religion, in what communities, at what points in a person's life will result in what features of positive youth development and contributions to self, family, community, and civil society. That's a complex question. That's how a researcher would go at it. Here's how, here's how we can just boil it down. How do we foster mutually beneficial relations between healthy young people and a nation that is marked by social justice, democracy, and liberty? That's what we're all about. That's what America is all about. Thank you.